Sarah, I think you told me on the phone that you were not a natural Trump supporter, but that when he got elected, you sort of came round to him. Just tell me about your political journey in that sense. Sure. I mean, Trump came on the scene as the non-politician, the non-Republican. I mean, he was a New Yorker. He was from Queens. He had Hillary Clinton to his wedding. He had given to Democrats and Republicans alike. And as a conservative and a constitutional conservative, I was thinking, how is this guy ever going to deliver on anything I like? He doesn't live a conservative life. He, I'm not sure I trust him on the social issues or... You know, yes, he's a businessman, but he's, you know, he likes to spend. Um, you know, I, I wasn't sure about him. But you came round to him, did you? I did. I didn't vote for him. I didn't vote for Hillary. I left it blank because my conscience in 2016 couldn't decide. Uh, but then he started to form his team around him after he got elected. And I must say that when he was elected, um, I think it was one of the most memorable and happiest times that Hillary Clinton lost. Uh, and so I think I probably was a Trump voter, but didn't know it because I wanted Hillary to lose so badly. But uh, he did form a conservative cabinet uh, and brought some really interesting people in, such as Larry Kudlow, who was Ronald Reagan's uh, cabinet secretary for Office of Management and Budget. And with Larry Kudlow at the helm, I knew that the economic policies were going to be fantastic. And sure enough, supply side economics dominated the Trump administration in the first term, which started to turn my head. And when the tax cuts happened, I couldn't, I was so chuffed, as the English say. Um, I knew that the economy would bounce back. And then um, I have to say, it was his judges to the Supreme Court, particularly his defense of Brett Kavanaugh, who had completely unsubstantiated claims against him, ruining his life and his reputation, hard earned. Uh, and I like the fact that Donald Trump stood behind him and got him on the court. Um, you began to see, did you, um, well, don't let me put words into your mouth, but um, did it become clear to you that in the culture war, the wider culture war, Trump was on the right side of things as far as you were concerned? Yeah, I mean, he immediately came out of the gate as pro-life. Uh, he attended the pro-life march the first time a, a sitting president in his first term has ever attended. Uh, I mean, he was passing executive orders for freedom of speech, protection of freedom of speech. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, he clearly was embracing the cultural right. Uh, and, you know, I, I couldn't be happier, really. As a Republican over here in Britain, um, with during the Trump presidency. What was the attitude, do you think, of what was the commonest attitude you came across amongst British people towards Trump? Was he popular? In, did he seem popular to you or not? Um, I mean, I think it depended on who I was speaking to and where I was geographically. Because if I left the M25, people tend to give him more of the benefit of the doubt and say, you know what? No, that Mr. Trump, he's good for America. I can see what he's doing. He cares about America. Um, but then if I, you know, talk to the metropolitan elites of London or what have you, it's just, oh, that ghastly man, that ghastly orange man, and took us out of Paris climate accords. And, you know, oh, he, what is he saying about NATO now? And kind of like to remind them that he actually increased the NATO war chest quite significantly by, you know, uh, promises up to 400 million. So, oh, sorry, billion, actually, <laughs> um, 400 billion. Um, so, you know, it really depended on where I was, but I think people could see that America was doing well under Trump, even if they didn't like the man, they, they heard about the economy and the unemployment, um, they, they saw the peace deals happening around the world, engaging North Korea, coming twice to the United Kingdom. I mean, more than any other country. I mean, he was an Anglophile, the most Anglophile president we've had in decades, probably since Reagan. Uh, so, you know, I think people didn't want to give him the benefit of the doubt or give him a nod because it was socially unacceptable, but they could tell things were doing well. What about the BBC? What attitude do you think they took towards Trump? A long exhale, a long sigh. 
They didn't want to deal with him. They didn't want to have to cover him. They were disgusted. I, I did many interviews at the BBC and where the producers and the TV crew would just roll their eyes when they watched the tape or it would, ex, you know, just go, oh, gosh. You know, they, I think they, there was an overall disdain for him. And that started, did it, as soon as he was elected? Is that, you know, was that the... Um, you know, was that the sort of view from the outset, would you say? I mean, yeah, I, they took their cues from the mainstream media in America, uh, you know, which was not positive. I mean, straight out of the gate, um, Trump was, you know, going to be impeached. That's what everybody was saying and that the Russians actually stole the election and who repeated those lines like a parrot, but the BBC. I mean, the BBC didn't seem to be doing any sort of independent journalism. They were taking their talking points from the Washington Post, the New York Times, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN. Um, I mean, it, it, they didn't, um, they were just getting talking points and I don't think they were getting at the root of why people voted for Donald Trump. Uh, you know, did they go to Wisconsin and really find out why did this state turn red for the first time in 30 years? Two stories which um, figure large in the immediate aftermath of his election in 2016 and running into 2017. One was the so-called Muslim travel ban. The other mm. was the um, uh, immigration issues on the southern border. They figured quite large in the BBC's coverage, didn't right. they? I wonder if you could just contrast that with now um, how, you know, Biden is, is now, the Biden administration is, is struggling with the same issues. But there's a difference, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, of course, they wanted Trump to be a racist because, you know, that's the worst thing you can be. And they wanted to put that on, on him um, and uh, characterize him as a monster. So, of course, he would, he'd hate Muslims. Um, you know, it, at the time, it was a security issue. Um, so whenever we have a security issue, you know, is it always going to be put through the lens of racism? Well, it isn't when the Democrats are in power. When Joe Biden's in power and he's thinking, oh, we're in the middle of a pandemic, maybe we shouldn't have people from China coming, you know, oh, it's not xenophobic now. Um, so, you know, I mean, if, if anybody is a Republican, they're already deemed a racist. I know when I go into the BBC studios, I'm looked at as a white supremacist and I'm looked at an oppressed... Uh, uh, a, a very misinformed or misguided woman, especially on women's reproductive rights, that like there's something wrong with me. Um, they do have me on, which I appreciate because they are giving the other side a voice. Uh, so I will give the BBC credit for that, but it's the lead in, it's the headline, and it's the omission of the stories. It's also, I was constantly on the defensive in all my BBC interviews. It was, you know, I was even asked one time, is, is Donald Trump a monster? Like, uh, what high-level thinking is that? You know, I'm sure the viewers are wanting to know, um, you know, what I think. Is he a monster or not? It's silly. Um, but it's also, you know, the, when it comes to the immigration, like southern border immigration issues, like, yes, we were having a humanitarian crisis at the time that was completely overwhelming the system, and we didn't have enough judges to process all these children and people, families, you know, but we weren't going to let, you know, Donald Trump wasn't going to let them just wander into the country hoping they show up for their court date. He wanted to be tough on immigration and he believed in that. Um, and people love, I mean, America is the land of immigrants, but we believe in legal and fair immigration. Uh, and that's what he, that was a real pillar of his presidency. You know, it happens under Joe Biden even more than what's happened under Donald Trump. And there's no wall to wall coverage. There are no children in cages, which they're in the same facilities as they were two years ago. You know, so it's um, they never take it just you're always it's always an uphill battle if you are center right. What accounts for this double standard? I mean, why would it be? that the BBC, which hasn't got skin in the game when it comes to American presidential elections, you know, why does it take the side of the Democrats in that way? I mean, put that in, how does, explain that to me. I mean, I think the American experiment is really unique in world history. And I think being a conservative, a limited government, constitutional conservative, 
is you don't find that in any other country around the world. So, you know, we, we were founded um, for freedom and liberty to maximize individual freedom and liberty. And it's based around a very important document that preserves those rights and freedoms. And so for, for conservatives, that's, you know, we live and die by that. We want to protect it and pass it on to our children. We realize how special and unique it is. I think it was Margaret Thatcher that said that America is created by philosophy, not history. Europe is created by history. So there, it's a purpose-driven nation. I think people on the left um, tend to be more internationalist, tend to like to uh, do things the way that, say, Europe does things. We'd like to see more of a social net, uh, a nanny state or a welfare state. Whereas conservatives want to be left alone to raise their kids and their family and, and just have the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion and conscience rights. These are all prevailing themes amongst Republicans, and um, the Constitution enables that. The, you touched on the issue previously. Uh, you said that you were interested in uh, women's reproductive white rights issues, and you, you yourself are pro-life, are you not? And, yeah. um, do you think that plays into the BBC's uh, attitude in these things towards... Was that an issue with Trump, do you think? Well, I mean, if you remember on Inauguration Day or, or around the time of the inauguration was the big women's march where everyone's wearing the pink hats. I won't even say the word of what they were, but they, the pink hats and they were all oh, rah, rah, rah. And, and what was it? Um, and it was basi basically a pro-abortion rally of women and feminists and Madonna. And, and then, of course, the wonderful... Um, Palestinian activist Linda Sarsour. I mean, you love it when you're in the company of people who've been accused of terrorism before, you know, you, could, <laughs> you just got to love that. But they, they were real cast of characters. And um, they, I know that it was portrayed over here as a real positive thing that women were fighting back against the big bad orange man. And that doesn't categorize all women. Um, in fact, I think it was white women that Hillary Clinton lost more white women voted for Trump, um, which of course the left can only see through the eyes of race. Uh, but I think it does have to do a lot with uh, cultural values. And, you know, the younger generations, especially with the aid of technology, are seeing that, you know, life does begin at conception. And life can survive out of the womb much earlier and much earlier. Uh, so, you know, the younger generation are coming around to a more pro-life position, even if they may hold economic left-wing views or environmentally left-wing views. When it comes to, to the right to life, um, I think it's winning. Um, and that is never portrayed uh, on the BBC. The largest peaceful protest in America on the coldest day of the year, mind you, every single year is the March for Life. And 100,000 people or more gather, mostly over, I would say, 65% are young people. Constant reference to this particular debate was made um, every time the, the question of um, candidates for the Supreme Court came up during mm -hmm. the, the Trump years, yeah. didn't it? I mean, it was something which was seen as being a very negative thing as far as the BBC was concerned. Yes, and that's exactly where the bias is there. I mean, whenever he put up a court nominee, it was um, always put in the negative light because he probably was going to vote down Roe v. Wade. Again, getting their talking points from the left-wing American media. This is why they went after Brett Kavanaugh with such fervor, uh, even though completely unsubstantiated claims against this man. Um, and I, I participated in many BBC debates on this, particularly BBC World. I appreciated that opportunity. To defend it. Um, I wish it was actually done more on um, BBC Woman's Hour or BBC uh, One would be nice. Um, but you know, and then of course when Ruth Bader Ginsburg dies, it's a coronation. I mean, it's almost like a state funeral for her, you know. And, and the fact is, um, I mean, granted, she, she has paved the way in many ways for women, but I can tell you when Amy Coney Barrett dies, it's not going to be the same coronation for her because she was, you know, she's right wing. I mean, she was a, she's a Catholic professor with five plus children. 
several adopted. That seems to be something to be respected and admired, but it was um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's uh, feminism and her work at the ACLU that enamored the BBC with her, as well as everybody else in American media. And so, you know, RBG shirts come out. Listen, I think she, I, I, I respect a lot about what she has said in the court and in interviews, but I disagree profoundly with her um, on, the, on the right to life. So, but a, a center-right woman will never have, I mean, look at how they've treated Margaret Thatcher. I mean, you'll, you're never going to get the same awe and um, coverage. The BBC, of course, sells itself. And many people still believe that uh, it is an impartial organisation. From the way you're talking, it seems obvious to me that you don't think that at all. I mean, what do you make of the BBC's claim to be impartial, even-handed, fair-minded? I think because they put people like myself on and they do try to tick the boxes of putting um, a pro, anti, etc. on, they feel they've done their job, they've done their bit. But the problem is they either they're too surrounded by people like themselves and they, they don't haven't really immersed themselves in the communities they're broadcasting to, so they don't understand how their questions and how their storylines and their headlines can seem biased to others. Uh, so maybe it's naivete, but they also have really big degrees and come from really big universities. So I, I, I don't want to give them too much of the benefit of the doubt because they, they have a job to do. And they need to go into the hinterlands and, and really understand, you know, why is it that the GOP is now turning into the, cla the party for the working class, you know? Why is it that, um, you know, you look at a map after an election and it's solid red except for the coasts and the cities? Is this really a good long-term election strategy for Democrats? Is focusing on identity politics, aka diversity, the environment, feminism, like, it, you know, really good for them? But they can't question that because they've embraced these identity politics uh, topics as well, not only in their hiring, but in their reporting. I mean, when Prince Philip died, the I don't know the name of the journalist, he's very famous, you would know who he is. Um, he was just commenting over and over again, don't you think that the Duke's legacy is his conservation, is his focus on conservation? Don't you, what about his work on the environment? Wasn't that just amazing? With every interviewee he made, even though they weren't making that point at all, and when he was talking to friends of the Duke and people who knew him. But so I just think that, you know, when you, you know, you embrace identity politics as an organization, it's very hard to report how other people view that in a non-biased way. The 2020 election, uh, which Trump, of course, famously lost, um, there were Aspects of the reporting of that, which struck me as odd. I don't know what you made, for instance, of. What about? Tell me about your view of the way, for instance, the BBC covered that election. In particular, some of the stories that arose during it. You know, the the way the Black Lives Matter thing was used as an issue, the Hunter Biden story, Antifa. Um, do you think that the BBC did a, a fair job on those things? I mean, I was a full-time spokesperson during the campaign, and my biggest press hits were when were the first debate with Chris Wallace, and it was all about, do you denounce Proud Boys? I had never even heard of Proud Boys. Didn't know what this was. Um, and then the second time was, oh, the president has COVID. Though, don't you think his COVID policy was wrong? Look, now he's the victim of it. Da, 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 da. So it was always negative, negative, but they never harped on Biden in that first interview when he said, oh, Antifa is just an idea. Antifa had murdered people by this point. They had destroyed, I mean, billions worth of property. They had taken over a whole section of Seattle, which most Brits don't even know, that became literally Lord of the Flies with rapes and murder. They are still attacking on a nightly basis courthouses and police stations in Portland, Oregon. I, 
it to me the complete silence over Antifa and the violence of the Black Lives Matter protests over 75 cities in America. America, we all thought, it felt, to people who were alive in 1968, they said, this feels like 1968. Like the completely unstable, like, a, like another virus other than COVID had just run rampant and had taken over our cities and nobody felt safe. Defund the police? What are you talking about defunding the police? Are you insane? That had ne that's not mainstream. And all of a sudden, these topics were mainstream and they were never challenged. They were never properly challenged. Biden was never held to account for his comments on that. And then the Hunter Biden story came out about his emails. The New York Post published it, completely centered by Twitter. Not even mentioned um, in, in debates or interviews. And um, I mean, people thought if you brought it up, you were fringe right wing. It was insane because they treated it as like, oh, these are like the emails from WikiLeaks with Hillary and that's what damned the last election. Well, clearly you're interfering with the election if you're not reporting on it because you're afraid that it might go the way you wouldn't like. That looks like systematic censorship almost, doesn't yeah. it? Oh yeah, I mean, I think uh, definitely. And he, Donald Trump did not have a fair field to play on when it came to the press or the media at all. Does the BBC have much influence in the US? Um, the BBC has a great reputation. I don't think people go to it for news. They do the BBC World News Service, perhaps. Um, but they always think of it, and I, I think Americans always think of Brits as being uh, having higher IQ based on their accent alone. Um, so they there is a lot of respect and all for it as an organization. It's it's depth and uh, breadth of an organization and um, and the period dramas that it produces. They love them. So there is a fondness for the BBC. And if someone says, oh, I'm from the BBC, everyone kind of sits up a little taller and tucks their shirt in. But I don't see it as taking cues like in the media from them. But amongst people like yourself, politically aware people, and particularly people who are on the right, what would their view now be, American people like that? What would their view of the BBC be, do you think? I mean, they probably think it's part of the mainstream media that has an axe to grind with the right. I mean, I think if anybody turns on the BBC now, any of my friends, they'll say, oh, this is just as bad as American news, you know, or, oh, this, or, oh, this topic, or why aren't they talking about this? I think they'd be very disgruntled with it. Um, and I think for most people on the right, Republicans who are very engaged, they have, there's a cynicism to any m mainstream news media. It doesn't matter really where it's from. Um, on the specific point of voter fraud and the claims made by Trump that the, um, that the election was stolen, um, how much credence do you give that and what, uh, how well do you think the BBC treated with that issue? Um, I think I, it was a very awkward and difficult time to be a Republican after the election and particularly after January 6th. Um, and, you know, I think to many Republicans, it would, we don't put it past the Democrats to stealing an election especially when they're one party cities, you know, the cities themselves are dominated by one party. So it's very easy to manipulate votes, especially when everybody wants to do a mail-in ballot, you know, uh, and the chaos that that, is, that that has ensued. I don't think that there is clear, uh, decisive evidence that proves Biden stole the election. I don't think that was proven and it wasn't proven in the allotted time that the law allows. So, you know, even if you go to court and you are found guilty, but you are innocent, you still have to serve a sentence. And I think as a land of laws, we have to respect the rule of law. And if the Electoral College still voted to elect Joe Biden, then he is the president elect. If there was not evidence that was put forward that was convincing enough at the time, then I, 
you, you have to accept the outcome. I hope we learn lessons from the chaos of mail-in voting, um, voting machines that may have mysteriously gone, lost power at certain times of the night. I, I hope we can hold to account. That has to happen at the state and local level. And it, I think it is happening. I mean, there are audits taking place. There are new voting laws where you need to have ID to vote. Very basic stuff. Um, and so uh, we, uh, hopefully it can be improved from here on out. The BBC kept saying, didn't it, throughout that episode, that there was no evidence of voter fraud. Was there any evidence of voter fraud? Yes, yes. We know that people who had died voted. Uh, we know that felon, uh, criminals with felonies who cannot vote voted. Um, we know that people voted multiple times because multiple ballots got sent to their house. So, but was there enough fraud to sway the election the other way? That's the question. And, uh, you know, Trump's team did not prove that in the time allotted. Now, you can say maybe we should streamline the voting process for a presidential so that all ballots look the same and are counted the same. So then if we have discrepancies or we have questions about legitimacy, it's much easier to then validate it. But um, these are lessons that we will learn after the fact. But I think the way the president behaved, stirring up emotion, um, questioning the republic, uh, questioning our election integrity, to a great extent, really was very damaging, um, will have lasting effects, and of course, I think led to losing the two Senate Georgia runoff seats for the, for the U.S. Senate, and then, of course, January 6th riot on the Capitol building. Do you think it's fair to say, actually, that Trump in some ways was his own worst enemy? Yeah, definitely. I think sometimes your greatest strengths can be your greatest weaknesses. I think it's very hard for him to lose. It made it, it made it very easy, didn't it, for his enemies to portray him as a bad and discredited man. Yeah, exactly. See, we told you. We told you all along this is what he was like. We knew this about him. You're naive. You couldn't see, you know, kind of thing. And the issue is, is over four years of pretty intense four years as a, you know, um, as president, he didn't crack like that. And he fulfilled his campaign promises. So I stand by my decision for voting for him on the information that I had when I voted. Sarah Elliott, thank you.